Uh, she's amazing. You're in for such a treat. It is Andy May. <laughs> told me that my hairdo was challenging. <laughs> Are you guys feeling challenged right now? Are you ready to overcome that challenge? Are we all in this together? Okay, I'm trying to be a lot more relatable. That's, that's really what this set is about tonight. So, uh, I woke up yesterday. Is that relatable? Okay. Thank God, oh, fuck. Uh, I woke up yesterday and I brushed my teeth. I'm still relatable, right? Okay, good. Uh, brushed my teeth, noticed a piss, bloody piss stain in the corner of my bathroom. Still relatable? Oh, dear God! <laughs> I continued brushing my teeth, and my cat walked in, and he stared at me in my human face, and then he lifted up his tail, and then he pissed blood on the walls, you guys. Uh, this has a happy ending, okay? Um, so I was like, what kind of nightmare situation am I in right now? Like, I wasn't stalling for, like, a psycho killer to come out and get me from the shower, because this is life, it's not a horror movie. Um, and uh, I started thinking, like, what if Stephen King wrote a horror book about Portland, Oregon, instead of Portland, Maine? It would probably take place at, like, the Doug Fur Hotel, and it'd be erected on the grounds of an African-American church because of gentrification. <laughs> and, like, Fred and Carrie would move in there, and they'd be, like, working on an art project, and then a demon cat would start spray-pissing blood on the walls, and that book would be called The Flanneling. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sick of Portland, you guys. <laughs> I'm exhausted. By Portland. I grew up here. Um, like, other cities, like in San Francisco, do they start eating, like, clam chowder out of a sourdough, a sourdough bread roll bowl, and they're like, oh my god, this is so San Francisco right now. No. They just get on with it. People in Seattle, they go to Starbucks, they don't fucking comment on it. They just get a cup of coffee. I'm so exhausted by Portland. Anyway, I took my cat to the vet, and it turns out that my cat has depression. My cat is really sad, you guys. My cat is so sad that he can put blood in his urine and put that on my wall. <laughs> and I started thinking, oh, what if I had a real friend? Stick with me on this, you guys. What if I had a real friend and his name was Carl, and Carl was mad at me, and then Carl decided to start pissing on my walls? I would not pay for Carl's medical bills. I would unfriend him on Facebook. So why am I an asshole for wanting to kill my cat? I don't want to kill him. I still love him. Uh, I was really offended by the whole thing, though, like, because I adopted my cat from the Humane Society. Uh, I pet him. I snuggle him. I give him food. I named him Winston, which is like a great name for a cat, right? <laughs> it's a fucking perfect name for a cat. And this is how he treats me. And then I realized maybe I need to start exposing my cat to new experiences. Maybe he just needs to understand the whole threshold of the human experience because he doesn't understand enough to know that he has it really good. Why is he depressed so much? So I'm going to start taking my cat to comedy shows. <laughs> so he can really understand the whole spectrum of the shit that we're in right now, right guys? We're all a team together. Okay, um, so this is a terrible transition because it's so obvious, but I hate cat calling. <laughs> Most of the time comedians are like, oh, I wish that I had a great segue. I have this great segue. I don't even want to use it. I hate cat calling. You guys are with me, right? <laughs> All the comedians in the back are laughing because they know what I'm talking about with segues. Uh, <laughs> um, the cute thing that I hate about cat calling is that it's called cat calling because like literally cat calling is where I'm walking down the street. I see a little kitty cat and then I bend down and I'm like, hey, Kitty. And then I pet it, and it purrs, and we have a delightful moment with each other. I'm mad that that genuine joy in my life has been co-opted by such a heinous act as harassing people on the street. That's not cool. Because me and that cat got along really well. And um, I think that, like, as a comedian, I do end up drunk 
at the bus stop at one in the morning very frequently, okay? Like, that's just, <laughs> just part of my day to day. And I think that we could really overcome a lot of social issues and achieve a lot more if we were a lot more positive and specific and uplifting while yelling at each other out cars at each other. Like, I'm never going to be able to stop catcalling. Like, I, I don't have that power. But it'd be really cool if while I'm waiting for that bus, truck full of bros pull up, their collars are popped, they got puka shells and, like, Massimo t-shirts, is that what, is that what bro cultures are wearing? It's a big dog right now. No, it's not. Run with the big dogs or stay on the porch, because I saw that in the 80s, and then I saw paying attention. Um, anyway, if these students pulled up to me and they saw me like, hi, hi lady, I can see that I was with short legs, white hips, and a long torso, you have a hard time finding clothing that you correctly because the fashion industry likes to marginalize women but you madam are no cookie cutter so I just want to let you know you do you girl <laughs> you do you that would warm the fucking cockles of my heart I wonder what carkles are we'll never find out I was drunk at the bus stop recently at one in the morning no surprise it's my Wednesday night and uh this dude came up to me and he said, hey, hey lady, he sounded kind of like Gilbert Gottfried, he was like, hey, I just want to let you know that your shoes, your hat, your jacket, your whole ensemble is very sexy. <laughs> and that was weird, guys, because I was dressed like this, like sexy is not the look I'm going for. <laughs> I'm going for rock and roll, king of badass, and I'm fucking nailing it. But, uh, <laughs> I was wearing a beanie and a jean jacket and fingerless gloves. So this dude thinks that Joe Pesci from Home Alone is sexy. <laughs> well, that's cool, because Joe Pesci needs to get laid, too. Am I right, guys? Yeah, we're sex positive here about Joe Pesci's sex life. Oh, God. Okay. So um, then he walked into the porn shop that I was standing in front of, and that was really confusing to me. That's a conflicting message, because it's not like... I'm being represented in porn stores. There's not like an ironic porn section going on. There's not people like absent-mindedly masturbating and being like, oh, oh, do you want to go see Weezer? Like that doesn't. <laughs> it's not real. It... Would that be hot? Do you guys, are you guys like that? Do you want to go see Weezer? Oh, Pinkerton was a good album. Oh. Um, maybe I, that doesn't give me a boner. You guys are welcome to have your own boner. So, but um, there's not there's not like there's not like a blow up doll with a cardigan on it, you know. And then and then I realized that I have the same hairdo as a blow up doll. So that's what this dude is into. So good for him. <laughs> uh, so I was at Seven Eleven the other day. Oh, weird. Normally I get an applause break for that. Okay. Um, I was at 7-Eleven and I saw a fucking cowboy in real life. Have you guys ever been stoned at 7-Eleven at 11 o'clock at night getting paps because of depression? <laughs> Have you seen a fucking cowboy while you're doing that? It's very confusing and alienating. Here's what happened. I was 30 feet away from the door. The cowboy saw me. We had a very awkward interaction because he saw a woman wearing pants with her own opinions out of the kitchen. I saw a goddamn cowboy in real life. <laughs> <laughs> then he held open the door for me and I'm a smoker and I'm like, oh, holy shit, I gotta run for this door. So I get up there. <laughs> I get up there and I'm like, hey, cowboy, thanks for holding open that door for me. Couldn't have done it myself. And then he said, yeah, man. God bless you, ma'am. And that was totally weird because I wasn't sneezing, right? <laughs> like, I'm a vegan atheist. And I know that that's annoying. It's just the way that God didn't make me. <laughs> I like 
of those pointing laughs the most. Of, ah, those are the best. That's what I live for. So, as a vegan atheist, I was really confused as to why one human being would do a favor for another human being and then use that as a way to proselytize to them, you know? Because, like, if I did the same thing as that cowboy, I'd be like, hey, cowboy, come on in. Held open the door for you. I'm a courteous individual. Me is murder, and nothing happens when you die. <laughs> That's my God bless you. <laughs> I do eat a lot of ridiculously named foods that try to impersonate delicious foods, like I eat tofu cuties. Yeah, they're good. I don't have a joke. I just like them. Uh, I also eat a lot of bacon. Bacon should be called Fawful, because it's fucking awful. <laughs> I also eat Tofurky. I genuinely, not ironically, unabashedly love Tofurky. I love Tofurky so much that I sat down and I wrote the people that make it at Turtle Island Foods. I wrote them a letter, and it said, Dear Turtle Island Foods, it was written in my shrill voice. And it said, Dear Turtle Island Foods, I love Tofurky. I love Tofurky so much that I think you guys should come up with a cruelty-free version of your duck in. You're going to have tofu on the outside, seitan on the inside, tempeh on the inside of the seitan of the tofu, and then you can call it tofucking. <laughs> These motherfuckers never wrote me back, you guys. I'm really upset by that. Uh, I hate my job. Who hates their job? Oh my god, you guys all like your jobs? <laughs> Are you all self-employed? Are you artists? Oh, do it! Do you all... Oh, I hate my job so much, you all are happy? God. Okay. <laughs> Good for you! Congratulations! I'm so happy for you! <laughs> No, um, uh, I hate my job. Uh, the, the one number one thing I hate about my job is my coworker Janet. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, so my my boss, my I got promoted recently. That was a bullshit move on my part. I never should have done this. I got promoted. My boss introduced me to a group full of strangers. Says, "Oh, this is Andy Main, and she's a stand-up comic." And so that meant I started having to tell jokes right off the bat to a bunch of people at 10 o'clock in the morning, but there's nothing funny about Wells Fargo, you know? <laughs> yeah, you guys. Oh, it's so sad. Oh, I have a salary. Oh, God, I want to kill myself. When I was 15 years old, uh, I had to write an essay about, you know, what, what my future wanted to be. And I went to a reading frenzy when that was on Hawthorne. This is real old school Portland, you guys back in 95 and I got a book that was called all you ever needed to know about anarchy but were afraid to ask and I wrote an essay about that and the thesis of the essay was birds don't have jobs but they're doing great <laughs> never examined that as being something maybe to think more critically about until this very moment. Anyway, um, <laughs> my boss introduces me to all these new people. I share a cubicle with this woman named Janet, okay? And the first time I met Janet, she was like, hi, my name is Janet, and I have three cats, and their names are Herman, Merman, and Sherman. <laughs> It's a fucking perfect Janet impression. Uh, Janet has a poster in the cubicle that we share, and it says, Life is just a chair of bullies! <laughs> <laughs> so you see what she did there? There's Life is just a bowl of cherries, right? That meaning, that, that, that phrase means so much to us, right? Like, that's so, that's so impactful. We all feel so much when we hear it. And then she circumvented it and turned it around. And when I look at it, I think art is dead. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just the worst. The other day, I had a sneezing fit. I had a sneezing fit at work. And Janet stands up and she goes, I heard that when you sneeze more than 10 times in a row, that's like having an orgasm. 
I had tears and snot running down my face. I was a fucking disaster. Janet thinks this is what an orgasm looks like, and I am terrified of Janet. I go to work stoned a lot. And uh, during those times when I'm like way too stoned at work, when like I've hit, I've smoked way too much pot, and I sit there in my cubicle and I start wondering about how um, we don't understand like the nature and fabric of time. I don't believe in God, but I'm really scared of death, and it's still emptiness. And I started wondering, like, you know, there's so many good movies out there, like American Beauty or Fight Club, where the protagonist quits their job in an amazing, ironic way, right? How should I quit my job? And I think I'm going to do it by standing up in my cubicle and scream crying quotes from Carl Sagan's Cosmos. <laughs> How amazing would that be, guys? If, like, okay, let's all imagine that we're work right now, okay? So we're sad and everyone's quiet. <laughs> okay, good. And then I stand up and I yell, In order to bake an apple pie! And first we must invent the universe! <laughs> and that gets people going. A slow clap starts, you guys. A fucking slow clap starts. And then I go, For small creatures such as we, the vastness is only bearable through love. And that slow clap keeps going. <laughs> and then I fucking stand up in my cubicle, like in Dead Poet Society, and I yell, The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies. Because Carl Sagan really liked apple pies. <laughs> <laughs> they are made with the interiors of collapsing star stuff. We are all made of star stuff. <laughs> and then I grab my shit and I get the fuck out. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> <laughs>